I want to start off with the basic training. Um, I got out of high school in 1966. I'd worked for two years. After two years, uh, it was July 15th, 1968. I received my greetings from Uncle Sam. He wanted me to report to the federal building downtown. So I went down there and got in this long line and I uh, heard this sergeant says, uh, Army, a few guys went to the Marines. But I was uh, lucky to go to the Army. So I went in there, went in the room. And this officer was in there, and he was, he was telling us about what we was going to do the day, for the day. And um, we had to take some aptitude tests, physicals. But before we did that, he gave us a lunch token to go to a, cafe, a restaurant downtown. And he said, uh, <laughs> come back in about an hour. So we did come back in an hour. And uh, we ended up taking physicals or whatever. And he told us, uh, now you can leave now and make sure you pack your clothes tomorrow because you're getting ready to go to your duty station. Uh, he says that you don't need, no, you don't need a whole lot of clothes because they're going to send you civil civilian clothes back home. So sure enough, the next day I went down there and I received my orders. And it was, we got on this bus and the bus took us over to the airport. My orders said uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. So I went to Fort Benning and the sergeant was waiting on us for uh, orientation. So he was, he was telling us about what uh, we was gonna do for the day. And the first thing he mentioned was everybody needed a haircut. So we went and got our GI haircut. I think he took just about everything off our heads. <laughs> and then we went to the supply room to uh, receive our uh, OD green clothes that we was going to use in basic training. And after that, we went to the uh, barracks. And uh, it was about, seemed like about 200 bunk beds in this big, long room. So we picked out whatever bunk bed we wanted, took a shower. Took off his uh, civilian clothes, got into our OD green, greens, and we had to fall out again. So we fell out and we got in line and the sergeant uh, marched us over to the mess hall. Went to the mess hall, got something to eat. Uh, we didn't stand there long because we couldn't uh, talk to nobody, anything like that. Just get something to eat and come on out. So we got something to eat, come on out. So he marched us back over to the barracks and he told us, well, you can shine your shoes and your belt buckles tonight, today. He said, but tomorrow, it's going to be a, that's when basic training is really going to start. Uh, the thing about basic uh, training, we had to pull KP, which I hated that. Plus, you had to clean the bathroom, mop the floor, buff the floor. So, you had to pull guard duty also. And, uh, it seemed like we spent most of our time out there in the field, you know, the rifle range. Uh, <clears throat> we did a lot of PT, that's for sure, push-ups, set-ups, things like that. And we should, uh, also we went, uh, we would walk maybe four or five miles, you know, in the hot sun. So it was, it was pretty hot down at Fort Benning, Georgia. <clears throat> uh, so, but we got along pretty good. It was a lot of work. A lot of intensive work we had to do, but uh, I think in the long run, it, it'll pay off as we go. So anyway, after basic training, um, I took a bus to Fort Polk, Louisiana for advanced training. I didn't get to go home. I think the bus ride was about, seemed like 13, 14 hours. But anyway, it was a long ride on the bus, so. Went to advanced train at Fort Polk, Louisiana. And uh, down there they had, uh, they set up a village like we was in Vietnam. And we had to train around this village and, and uh, you know, know how to go in a village and how to secure a village and, and uh, protect ourselves and all that. I didn't really care too much about advanced training because most of my training was basic. You learned just about everything in basic training. You learned about uh, landmines also and how to fire weapons and basic training and all that. So after advanced training, I received a 30-day leave, I think it was, to go home. 
to be with my parents and my sisters and brothers. So after 30 days, I had to report to Seattle, Washington to receive my clothes for overseas. So I went to Seattle. I stayed there for about three weeks. And after three weeks, uh, me and some, uh, some of the other guys, we got on this big long plane. It was a, I never forget, it was a red plane, said America on the plane. And we was on our way to Vietnam. But we st so we stopped in Alaska for two hours and it was cold as you know what. <laughs> so we got off the plane and started running for the uh, terminals because back then you had to go down these, you had to go down the steps on the planes, you know. So it was, it was cold. So we, was, uh, so we stopped in Alaska, like I say, for two hours then after Alaska. We was headed for uh, uh, Cameron Bay in Vietnam. So, and if, uh, everybody on the plane had on field jackets. So once we landed at Cameron Bay, it was, seemed like over 100 degrees. It's hot as heck. So we, uh, sergeant told us, say, when you get off the plane, you get your baggage and run like hell to the building because we might get incoming rounds. So we did that and I think, I think I was there for about an hour and uh, I think it was like a C-47. I know it was a plane that took me up at uh, the first cavalry base camp at An Kay, which was up in the central highlands. I went up there, stayed up there for three weeks. Every night we had incoming rounds. After three weeks, I took, a, I took a, a plane and I went to a place called Quanoi. I went down there in Quanoi, and, and that's where uh, I received my uh, M16 training, because I'd never seen an M16 in my life. We trained with M14s. So I was issued a rucksack, M16, a 45, uh, as many canteens I wanted to carry with water in it, uh, C4, of course a trenching tool, because you, you never know when you might have to go to the restroom and dig a little hole, but anyway. <laughs> so after that, uh, so the next day, uh, sergeant was telling me, the first sergeant was telling me, he said, Kennedy, the next day, you're going into combat. You're ready for combat now. So. I got on the, I took my first helicopter ride and went out to the field and I got with the uh, first cavalry, Bravo Company, second and eighth. As soon as I got off the plane there and I walked toward a couple of people and I told them, it stinks out here. And I heard one of the persons say, well, you'll get used to it. It's just a matter of time, you know, so, which was true enough after I'd been there for a while. And, uh, but anyway, walking through the jungle with all that, my backpack seemed like it weighed about 90 pounds. And uh, they probably had enough food in it to last for about two or three weeks. But it was, it was pretty hot out there and pretty rugged. Uh, also, you might see a few snakes on the ground, but you just let them go on by. As long as you don't bother them, they're not going to bother you. So just let them go. And... Uh, we worked as a company, and we got along real good. Um, sometimes the helicopters would come out and resupply us. If we needed food, they would come out and uh, drop off some food. I mean, and uh, resupply us with food. You see a person out there with their hands up with a rifle, bringing the choppers in, which I enjoyed doing that once I, you know, got a chance to do it. And you, it would bring out food to you and mail. Uh, some people got packages. And if you didn't get a letter or a package, you really felt bad. And maybe your buddy would say, well, here, Kennedy, you can read my mail. Or you can have a, a slice of my cake, you know. So we were, we were a tight unit, and we looked out for each other. Uh, the thing about it, though, if you ran out of water, now, that was another, you, know, you, was, you had a problem there. Because we didn't, you know, people didn't, we didn't share our water that much. 
Because you might see a person shaving, uh, washing up out there. You're wasting water. And nobody's going to share their water with you. You know, when you're out, when you're out in the field, you don't have time to, to shave and wash up. You know. But some people did that. Uh, also, uh, my job was, basically I was an infantryman. All of us out there was an infantryman, just about. We had, some of we had radio operators out there, <clears throat> machine gun, people who carried machine guns and things like that. But it seemed like every day we did the same thing. And our job was to engage the enemy before the enemy engaged us. So, uh, it was pretty rugged and hot as heck. Sometimes we'd have to go into like a bunker complex area and uh, <clears throat> try to get the enemy out of there. And we'd throw grenades in there, or whatever we had to do. But some of these areas, was, they were amazing. It's just like we're sitting right here, and you're on the ground. I never in my life seen anything like it. But we did what we had to do in order to, you know, accomplish the mission. Uh, we had some good forward observers. They would call rounds in for us. Uh, we had a good captain. And uh, we got along real good out there, you know. Uh, that was the first time that I really operated that much with, uh, you know, with blacks, you know, with white people. Just black and white, you know, so. And uh, you like brothers out there, you know, with no difference, you know. And, you know, I would have people, some of the people would tell me, well, when we go back to the world, I want you to come meet my family, which I thought was nice, you know. Also, uh, in Vietnam, uh, I was wounded three times over in Vietnam, unfortunately, you know. I think it was February, August, September. September was the worst wound that I received. And I had a good doctor, had a good profile. The first sergeant or captain couldn't send me back to the field because of what the doctor said. Well, the first sergeant tried to send me back to the field. What he didn't know was the doctor told me to come get him if somebody tried to, so. We solved that problem right quick, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, pays, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I'm just, uh, at the time, I was just a spec four. I was promoted to sergeant, but I was just a spec four. I'm thinking, well, here's this uh, first sergeant, been, over, been in the service probably 30 years or whatever. I can't uh, break, break the chain. And something told me, said, if you don't want to go back out in that field, you better break the chain. You know, so that's what I did. I did what the, uh, the major told me to do, or I think it was captain told me what to do, so. It worked out real good. So all I did, I, 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 I spent about nine months all together, I think, in, in the field. And I spent, uh, what was it, three weeks in the hospital. It was a field hospital. And uh, after that, all I had to do was I was a sergeant of the guard over there. I had three bonkers I had to take care of, make sure my men had the proper equipment, and all the, you know, weapons, ammunition, everything like that. And I knew all the guys in the first place, so there's no problem. And he told me, he said, well, Kennedy, here's a Jeep driver for you. I said, I'm not a commission officer, you know, and that's okay. So all I did then was just ride around in the Jeep at night, check on the bunkers. But most of the time, I just went, I'd go back to the barracks and go to sleep and tell the Jeep driver to give me a call if something went wrong, you know, so. <laughs> It worked out good for me the last uh, two and a half months, something like that, you know. But I really miss the guys in the field, though. It's like, you know, you're leaving them behind, you know. I really miss them. And uh, I think that's about all I have to say. I'm trying to make it short because originally what I, what I was going to say was going to be real long, so I said I better leave some of this basic training stuff out, you know. <laughs> so. Any questions? Day? <laughs> wow. We were just, we were running again. Uh, where'd you go on R&R? &R? Uh, I went to Hong Kong on R&R. &R. And, and plus I had in-country on R. 
Bong Tao. I was a soldier of the month. What? Yeah. It was about three of us. We were soldier of the month, you know, and they gave, and they, they gave us a, 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 what was it? They gave us a cigarette lighter with our names on it and everything. And our same as Bonds. And we stayed in house trailers with the sergeant made, you know, we stayed in house trailers then. We didn't sleep on the ground. Because that's where all the big shots stayed. Sergeant majors, some of the generals, you know, so. Yeah, Dave. When did you receive your bronze star? Uh, good question. Bronze star, let's see. I don't, pass them out. I, don't remember, I don't remember exactly when I received. All I know is after I got wounded the last time, I was told I was promoted to sergeant and I received a bronze, I was going to get a bronze star. I don't know exactly when I, when I got it. Then they wanted you to reenlist? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> but you know the thing is, I was in there, what, two years, and I'm thinking, well, it's over with. I'm, I don't have to go back. But it's a six-year ob six obligation. So luckily, I didn't have to do no reserve time. You know, I was in active reserve, so it worked out good for me. And after that, I went back to, you know, work. Any more questions? Yes, sir. I got all kinds of questions. When you got there, were you wondering when you were going to get your weapons? Uh, yes. Yes, because I didn't get weapons when I first got there. <laughs> You're right. Mm -hmm. I didn't get my weapon until about, I think it was the second, one, two, the second time, you know, that I went to the other base and I got my weapons. Uh, yeah, because, uh, come and think of it, the first base, I, mean, see, on K, I was up on K, like I say, for three months. And what happened, like we had an incoming every night, and this sergeant, he'd go running around there saying, well, we got uh, Vietnamese in the, inside the perimeter, North Vietnamese. And you might hear somebody say, well, I don't have no weapon. He said, well, get a stick, anything. <laughs> you know. And uh, he dumped this one person out of his bunk. You know, and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, you want to keep your weapon by your side at all times, that's for sure. Even, you know, when you're out there in the, in the field, uh, if you're pulling guard duty, sent by a foxhole, that weapon is always right by your side. Yeah, Dave. Were you with First Cav? First Cavalry, yes. Were you with the First Cav yourself? No, but we supported you. Oh. Okay, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. How that experience has been with uh, the Vietnam veterans and the OIF, OEF uh, soldiers, and how that's playing out with the MOPH uh, advancing in the community? Uh, yes. Uh, it's, uh, I, I really, I'm really proud to be the commander of uh, Military of the Purple Heart up in Cheviot. And, uh, I know when I first joined the chapter, I had no idea I'd be the commander, you know. but. But what we, what we do as uh, Purple Heart members, not only the commander, we go out and try to help people. You know, a lot of people, they don't know how to file claims or they might be something wrong with them. They don't, they don't know who to go to. So we send them to, you know, our national service officers, things like that. Yeah, Dave. Okay, when you went down to the federal building, you got drafted, did the Red Cross give you a little going away present? All your toilet items and stuff like that in a little bag with with the Bible. I I don't remember. Salvation Army. It they might have, but I I'm, I'm not. I don't remember. I was so glad to leave there and go home for a while. <laughs> I don't remember. I didn't get to leave. You didn't. No. You didn't go home and change and come back. Nope. Oh, I did though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I came back the next day. And left on a bus for, for uh, the airport. 